So what I'm saying to you is that a great cardiologist is not one that can only do a great stent. Yeah, you hope he does a good stent too. But the better one is the one that's going to make sure you don't get progressive disease and that you don't rupture your plaques and that you will die with your plaques, not from them. There's so many patients that I see where the CT scan show chloral calcium, they pass their stress test, and the FFRs are all okay. So what are you going to do with those patients? They have a calcium score of 1,800, and they're walking around feeling great. Stress test is fine. No problem. CT angio, no problem. They just have a lot of calcium. Well, they'll live with that calcium, just don't die from the calcium. So, stabilize it. Don't let it crack. Now, when it cracks, a blood clot forms. So a heart attack is just as much inflammation causing the plaques to crack. And key point, it's also hematological. That means if your blood is very thick and sticky and it's hypercoagulable, you're going to get a small crack and a big clot. Got it? You see... Some people can crack to the same extent, but if his blood is clotty and you have a high viscosity because your hemoglobin is very high, let's say, or you have lipoprotein little a, which will predispose you to larger blood clots, then you are going to get a large blood clot. She may rupture and just get a small little blood clot and it'll heal over. And she's done. And the rate of progression of disease in you is going to be far more than her. Because every time you both crack, she's just getting a small clot and it's healing over. And just the percentage went up by 5% or 6% only in him. Every time it cracks, the stenosis is getting progressively more and more and more because larger clots form in it. Because when the clot forms, it then gets covered over. So my point is, when you're looking at the workup of these patients, you need to look at inflammation, which I told you about already. You also look at, need to look at your blood. Is your blood clotty? I look at that. So you've got to determine whether your blood is predisposing you to large blood clots or not. That's why we do the advanced lipid panel. We do blood counts. And that gives us a lot of information to predict what will happen to you. How, how rapidly is your calcium going up? So let's say you got a calcium score this year of 1,800, and next year it's 2,500. You have a problem. You got the burners on. You're cooking inside. So you need to find out what's going on in here. So there's so many things we look at besides it. Okay, I told you about the infl inflammation. I told you about the blood clots. There are other things also. Nutritional deficiencies cause this to progress also. Bad food, all the processed food, all the Maillard reaction, which is all these aging products. For when, you, when, when you take, for example, your food and you excessively brown it and excessively cook it, all those molecules get absorbed into your body and they cause hardening of the arteries as well. So it's not just what you eat, it's also how you're cooking your food. Kill your food and then it kills you. you you got to be careful how you cook your food also. So it's not only what you eat. And of course, those are all topics of discussion for another day. But it's what you eat, how often you eat. And what you eat, how did you cook it? And what kind of oils did you use in it? So how easily oxidized was it? It gets really complicated. Oxidation is really important. So if you're eating a lot of vegetable oils, for example, you're going to get a lot of oxidative stress in your body. And that oxidative stress is going to hurt your arteries big time. And it's going to cause acceleration of plaque formation. There's a lot of things to look at. So we do a deep dive into all these things. Um, so all that doesn't sound very glorious, but putting a stent in somebody or sending them for bypass, right, you are now a real doctor. 
But I'm saying to you, a real doctor is not that. Some of my technician friends who help me when I'm doing angioplasty, they can probably do it on their own and probably do a better job than a lot of others that I know. So what I'm saying to you is that a great cardiologist is not one that can only do a great stent. Yeah, you hope he does a good stent too, or a great surgeon that does great surgery. But the better one is the one that's going to make sure you don't get progressive disease and that you don't rupture your plaques and that you will die with your plaques, not from them. And by the way, the same processes that I talk about here about inflammation and lifestyle also reduce your risks of having uh, a stroke, blindness, kidney failure, some cancers, digestive joint disease, neurogenerative diseases of the head. So there's so many benefits because ultimately it all comes down to inflammation. Our lifestyle will cause coronary disease and all the other diseases that I just mentioned all come down to our lifestyle. That's why we need a lifestyle change. That's what we all need today. It's a lifestyle change. So we talk about the parasympathetic nervous system, nervous system, and I teach patients how to hack the parasympathetic because parasympathetic is the healing aspect of your system. If you're only sympathetic all the time, you're going to get blood clots. If I take some adrenaline and shoot it into you, you're going to make blood clots right now. Your platelets become really sticky and jittery. See what I'm saying? Because you're ready for war. Fight, flight, flight. So everything impacts my arteries. And whether I'm going to rupture and whether I'm going to get a big blood clot on it or not. Depends also on my demeanor, how I am, whether I'm happy or joyful, or do I feel stressed, or do I feel angry? Because how is my body interpreting what I'm living right now? It's going to determine what's happening here, because my entire physiology changes. See? So it's fascinating. I think coronary artery disease is linked to everything else, and that is why we are very, very aggressive in the in this uh, field. And all of you are here because you're interested to prevent heart disease. Yeah, today's lesson is that most of you don't need a stent. Most of you are not going to need a bypass. That's only for patients who have tight blockage, either they're having symptoms or they have objective evidence of lack of circulation. If you don't have objective evidence with a nuclear stress test or, or EKG changes, then you must get some form of testing. If it's an angiogram, you do an FFR before you stand. Or you do a CT angiogram and you look for an FFR. And if the FFR is high, then I'm much more likely to say, you know what, you need to come to the cath lab with me because now I need to go in. And when I do my angiograms on those patients with positive FFRs, I'm doing my own FFR in the lab as well. So I measure the FFR, put the wire down, Make sure this lesion does really need to be fixed and then fix it. And the outcomes are so much, much, much better than if you just blindly go in and put stents in. Remember, if I put a big stent over here and now there's only a short bit of artery over here, and let's say, God forbid, you re-narrow this whole segment here where the stent is, how are you going to bypass this patient in the future? See, stenting is not that a great solution to everything because you need a nice piece of artery here to put a bypass into. But if there's only a tiny piece of artery left and you bypass into that, the bypass will shut down because there's no flow. So stenting changes your future and your future options as well. That is why we must make sure the FFRs are done and only open up the blockages that are causing a problem. See, you do an angiogram. The beginning of the artery may have a narrowing. There's a moderate area here, but let's say that there's a really tight one here. Then just put a stent here, and then you can measure the FFR across this one. What often happens is that they see that there's a 50% here, there's a 90% here, right? But if you put the wire down and you do a pullback FFR, a pullback FFR, 
that tells you there's a drop across this one. Oh, no, there isn't. This one, oh, yeah, there it is. I saw the blood. I, I saw this. I saw the pressure change. Then you put a stent in this one and not this one. On the CT angio, when you get the FFRs back, I've already seen that on many patients. But what happens is the FFR here may be abnormal. It may not accurately tell you exactly which blockage, but on the angiogram, when I'm doing it, I can accurately pull back and see exactly which lesion is causing the drop in the pressure on the FFR and stent only that particular blockage and leave the rest alone because it's not flow limiting. And then comes the hard work. Here's your diet. Here's your lifestyle. This is good. This is your nutrition. This is going to be your metabolic workup. These are the prebiotics or whatever I'm going to give you. This is your insulin. How are we going to manage your insulin resistance? This is going to be your sleep pattern from now onward. This is what you're going to do to hack your parasympathetic nervous system. This is what you're going to do. And you talk about these things, get the patient through everything, and they'll be doing great. If you enjoyed this short segment, here's another clip that I think you'll really enjoy. And if you'd like to see the whole video, then click here.